speaker. So today we are joined by Rachel Scalar, a parent coach and a local Bay Area mom. She's going to be showing us some specific communication, communication tools that set up children for success when it comes to listening, understanding, and responding to requests. Um, so I went online and Googled Miss Rachel a little bit. She is a local mom, Bay Area, a mom of three, and you should see her list of accomplishments. It's really cool. Uh, just to name a few, she has a master's in social work. Uh, she um, in children and family services at UC Berkeley. Um, she's a parent educator at Parents Place and on the peninsula. Um, she got a National Association of Social Workers Award recipient for research on effectiveness, effectiveness of parent education. And honestly, the list goes on. It was so fun to read her bio. And there's a cool snippet at the bottom of it if you read the whole way through. Rachel's a dynamic speaker and an incredible resource for parents who long for an easier life with kids. And we have her here today. Please welcome me in joining Rachel. Thank you so much. That was so sweet. I don't know if anyone's Googled me to find my bio before. <laughs> that was wonderful. And I just have to share something with all of you. Right now is the first time in, I don't know how long, maybe a year that I've been alone in my own house. <laughs> and I feel like kind of weird about it and nervous about it. My husband took the kids out for the day and um, hopefully they won't come in the middle of this talk because they're going to come in really noisily. But um, I just know that everyone is such different circumstances going on at home. And I just want to acknowledge all of you for making time to be at something like this. It says so much about you. And I thank you on behalf of your children. I thank you um, because, you know, showing up for something that supports you as a parent is such a gift to your child. Um, and also, I want to thank you just for inviting me to be here today. Um, it's, it's always an honor to speak to a group like this. So I'm excited to get started. Um, our topic today is called I'm Talking, They're Not Listening. So I took a 90 minute presentation and we're going to like <laughs> squeeze it in and we're going to skip some things. That's okay. I chose kind of all the best pieces of it to be able to share with you today. Um, but I always like to start um, with a little bit of an introduction about myself because I think it always really helps when you know who's talking to you. Um, so um, like Michelle said, I, I got my master's degree in social work at Berkeley. That was before I had children. I studied the effectiveness of parent education. It was only natural for me to go into the field of supporting children and families and education for parents. I actually started in Contra Costa County. I was a CPS worker. I did um, investigations of foster parents. And it was in that role that I was like supporting foster parents, um, not just you know holding them accountable, but also helping them learn how to raise really tough kids. And so I was writing parenting articles and, and doing parenting workshops and so, and reading lots of parenting books. And so obviously like, I was very excited to have children of my own because I knew everything, <laughs> you know? So if you were one of those moms who felt like you, you know, you, you knew how to do it before you did it, you know, that was me. I was a better mom before I had kids. There's a book by that title. Um, anyway, I, I, I met my husband and, you know, got pregnant and I became a mom, an awful mom, terrible. I was horrible at it. Nothing that I had read in these books worked. And are you one of those people who's read parenting books and felt worse afterwards or tried, you know, what you learned and realized that like there must be something wrong with me or something wrong with my child because this doesn't work. You know, I, I remember when my kids were little driving to preschool and just sobbing in the car on the way because I just didn't understand what they needed, you know. Well, I mean, fast forward, I now have a 13, 11, and eight-year-old boy, all boys, and being a parent is the joy of my life. I absolutely love it, and I feel like I know what I'm doing most days, you know, and the reason is that when I was at a really low place in my parenting, I decided to go back to work to get a break from parenting because my, my first son, he, I didn't know it at the time, but he has a highly sensitive personality, highly sensitive temperament. And my second son is what they call strong willed. I don't know if they even call it that anymore, but this kid is not, not motivated by anything other than his own pure will, <laughs> you know, his own desires, internal desires. And the two of them together, I always say they were like 
if you had them one on one, they were delicious. You know, you could give them 100 percent attention. But and so they, so so separately, they were delicious, but together they caused an explosion. And my best metaphor for that is, do you remember the Mentos and Coke combination? Like if you take the Mentos candy and put it in a Coke, you're supposed to get a <laughs> explosion. <laughs> you know, that that's, was what it was like in my family. And so when I went back to work, I actually didn't feel like I could go back to supporting families because I felt like a complete fraud. And so instead I went back to school and I trained at the Seattle Pacific University Parent Coaching Institute. And it was there that I spent a year realizing exactly what was wrong <laughs> for me. And this is why I share this story because I want everyone to hear this is that I got in that year that I was so busy leaning on expert advice and leaning on the internet and on books and on people who didn't know my children to give me advice and to tell me how to do it. And what I wasn't doing is I wasn't asking myself the right questions. Like what are my values? And what are my children's strengths? What's good and right about them that I can learn from? How can I look at my children and see what's special about them and actually use that information to come up with a parenting approach that's unique to them? And when I started doing that, I began to love parenting. I began to get to know my children so deeply that I knew what they needed. I could predict what they needed. And I loved it so much that I went ahead and had another baby, you know? <laughs> um, and so what I wanna say as a caveat for today is I'm gonna give you lots of tips and tricks cause I know that's what you love. But I also wanna say, I'm also gonna give you some questions to ask yourself, but I really want you to know that if I say something or I give you some advice that you go home and it doesn't work for your child, there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with your child. There's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> I just don't know your kiddo, you know? And so what I do today in my practice is I coach parents individually and in small groups to figure out what's the secret sauce for their kiddo. And I have three boys and the secret sauce is different for all of them. And figuring that out is such an important part of our parenting journey. And so today what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about communication and how we can get them to like just listen because we're talking to them in a way that speaks to them, right? And, and not in a way that we think should speak to them. So um, I'm going to, uh, just a logistical thing. If anyone has any questions, please put it in the chat. I don't promise to be able to answer it because we're in such short time, but it's great for other people to see what your questions are, and then you'll have them to take with you in the next phase of this meeting today. Um, okay, so I have a little presentation. Um, give me a second. I, we're not going to do every slide because of timing, um, but just quickly, like we're going to we're going to do some reflection questions on communication. We're going to talk about the basic sort of why kids ignore us and then also specifically why does your child ignore you. Um, and then I'm going to share with you one of two models of communication that I like to teach. And then I have nine tips and we're going to choose three of them to go through together just in the interest of time. But you'll be able to see them grayed out if you want to just read what they are and get the tip. But I won't be talking about all of them. OK, um, so I love this image. This is like how we are when we're with our kids. A lot of times we're like, pay attention, you know, and they don't. <laughs> so let's just talk about some questions that we can ask ourselves. Like ask yourself this question, share the answer in the chat or save it for when um, when we um, when we break up break out into smaller groups, but how do you press your child's pay attention button when you need your child to pay attention? What do you do? They're ignoring you, and you really need them to listen up. What's your what's your go to method? And I'm not saying that this is something you have to be proud of. I'm not saying like this is your ideal way of trying to get your kid to pay attention. But what works for you and your child to get to get them to listen? And then the next question is, what does your child do to get you to listen? Like, what does your child have to say to you if you're distracted on your phone or distracted on your computer, or really focused on a recipe, you know, like, what does your child do to get your attention? And it, again, is not necessarily our ideal behavior, but kids figure out ways that work to get our attention. You know, my kids know <laughs> that you know, if uh, th they've learned this in a kid power workshop, which is they say it's for my safety. And then I'm like, OK, I have to pay attention because I need them to trust that if they ever have a safety issue, I'll, I'll listen. 
And then a couple more questions is, when it comes to communication, what do you actually value most? I mean, think about your communication with your, your friends, your family members, your colleagues, if you have them, you know, in the world, when you watch the news, like what kind of communication do you value? Because a lot of times we don't actually live according to our value system. Our, our actions and our communication is not necessarily aligned with our deepest values. And when those aren't aligned, we feel off, right? So that's another question to reflect on. And then in terms of your communication with the world, what works on you and what do you want to teach to your children? Because you're, you're a communication role model. They're learning how to communicate in the world by being in communication with you all the time. And so you want to ask yourself, if I wanted someone to give me hard news or to tell me to do something, what do I appreciate? What works for, for me to listen? And, and is that something that I want to teach my child? Okay, so you can feel free to share in the chat. Let me just gonna take a second to open the chat so I can see it while I'm talking. Um, okay. Sorry. So we're not going to talk about development, but let's talk about why don't kids listen when we talk. So just generally speaking, human beings do not like to feel controlled by others. We don't like to feel like someone else is trying to control us. And when we do, we dig our heels in and we get kind of resistant. But we're actually pretty open to being influenced by others. And there's kind of a distinction, you know, so they may, if your child is feeling like you're trying to control them or boss them around or be commanding, they might not listen. But if you are saying things in a way that sort of influence their point of view or help them transition from one thing to another, then they're more likely to listen. Also, they don't listen because we've just straight up trained them to ignore us by nagging. Every time we repeat ourselves and we repeat ourselves again and again and again, and every time we do it, all our kid thinks is, oh, I guess she didn't mean it the first time, <laughs> right? And they wait until we actually mean it, you know? A little quick example, when I realized last year when we were going to school, we had to go down a set of stairs to get to the garage um, to get in the car to go to school. And I would start saying to everybody, let's go, it's time to go downstairs, let's get, in, let's get in the car, everyone get your shoes on, get your backpacks, get in the car, and I would repeat it over and over and over again, and they would just flat out ignore me. And then I did a little work, you know, a little self-reflection work, and I realized that I was saying that while I was still washing the breakfast dishes. <laughs> and the truth is, I didn't mean it, because it wasn't until I started going downstairs that they followed me, you know, and so we had a little family meeting about it. And we made an agreement that I wouldn't repeat that more than one time and that they would come when I started moving downstairs. So um, another reason is that they just don't share our agenda. Like, you know, we want to get places on time. We want to do things. We want to follow our routines. We have expectations. We want them to do chores. We want to teach them values and they want to play, right? They're engaged in their world. They live in the moment, right? They, no matter how old your child is, like they're just, they're into what they're into. And when we try to stop them and interrupt something that they're focused on, we're, we're prioritizing our agenda over their agenda. And so it makes sense that they're like, wait a minute, no, what I'm doing is more important than what you want me to do. Your agenda doesn't matter to me. And so I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing, right? And so if you have other reasons that you think just generally your kids don't listen when you talk, please share them in the chat because there definitely are a lot more reasons. But let's talk about what specific, like what's about your child, your specific child, why doesn't your child listen? And so generally speaking here, like one reason your child may not listen is because of their temperament. Every child is born into this world with a unique temperament. And if you have a child who um, maybe is just like distractible, you know, or not distractible or extremely persistent with an activity that they're working on or have really intense reactions to things, or maybe you're, maybe they're not listening because they're blocking out a like overwhelming sensory overload. You know, I've, I, that's my oldest son. He's just like, when he's not listening to me, it's because his sensory system is overstimulated and all he can do to cope with it is to just block out the world. You know, he has a, he has a top bunk. We gave him a curtain around it. And so he goes in there and it's like, he's not in the house, you know, <laughs> he's like in his nest, you know? 
Um, and so we need to approach him differently than calling to him from across the house, you know. Also your child's learning style. I mean, some kids are more auditory and they're just very responsive when you say things, but other kids need a more visual stimulation. They need to see, you know, the request in action. Or maybe they're a kinesthetic learner. Maybe they need their body engaged, you know, to, to really listen. Maybe we need to walk them places by the hand to get them to do things, you know. So thinking about what your child's learning style can help you sort of customize your communication plan for them. And like I said, for all three of my kids and all of my clients that I work with privately, figuring this out is so important um, because we really need to learn what approach is going to work for them. Um, I also like to think of this question of like, what's your child's love language? And I actually posted this question on Facebook recently. You're all welcome to friend me on Facebook. I'm very open. Um, and I, I asked this question, what's your child's love language? And people were saying, some people were saying things from the book, the love languages book, gifts, uh, quality time, acts of service. But other people were saying things like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, like watching Avengers together and tickles and snuggles. And, you know, what is that thing that helps you feel so connected to your child that they'll do anything for you? You know, so thinking that's the question is like, what is... What do you do to connect with your child so that they feel so worthy and so valuable that they'll just do anything that you want them to? <laughs> um, okay, so let's move on to how do we get our children to listen? Um, so I'm just gonna share this one model. Um, and so this is kind of like what not to do and what to try instead. And it takes practice. I just wanna acknowledge that this is really, really hard to do all the time, but it's a really great idea to just bring some awareness to how you speak to your child, okay? So first, we often as parents, you know, like it or not, we use commands, you know, we say things like stop that, you know, or <laughs> the thing I hear most lately is get on your zoom meeting, you know, or put your plate away. And by the way, no matter how old your child is, whether you have a 17 year old or a three week old, this is important to listen to because if your child's pre-verbal and, and doesn't understand all of this, you're actually teaching them to communicate right now, even a three week old, you know? Um, and so it's time to start practicing these things. It's never too early to start practicing. And it's also never too late to, to shift this if you have an older child. Okay, so when we make these commands, we are trying to be controlling. And, and like I said earlier, we, we actually invite resistance. Our kids are gonna be like, ah, ah, I don't like that feeling, you know? And so I don't wanna do that put your plate away, you know? Um, and then another thing that we do a lot as parents is we give away our power by asking our children questions. Why are you doing that? Do you wanna be late? Aren't you going to put your plate away? We ask them questions and we give, we give away our power because then we give them the option to be like, uh, no, I'm not gonna put my plate away, I'm busy, <laughs> you know? And, and it just does, it's not clear communication. It's shaming, it's guilting, and it, it communicates there's something wrong here with you. So we don't wanna give away our power. And we also don't wanna disempower our children. We wanna take away power from our children either, right? A lot of times we'll just insult them. We'll be like, you're so rude. Or, oh God, I'm raising a slow poke. And my mom used to say that to me. Or you're being a slob. So we just, we, we say these things thinking that it will motivate them <clears throat> when all we're doing is we're just making them feel badly about themselves. And that's not motivating. You know, we actually need them to feel good about themselves because that's when cooperation is increases, listening increases. Kids who feel good about themselves usually act good, you know, usually pay attention. So what's the alternative in this model? I'm suggesting that we just practice using more statements. Statements are very fact-based and we are opening up for a power sharing conversation, you know? So in this sort of string of stop that, why are you doing that? You're so rude. What if you said something like, I saw you hit your sister. That's a fact, right? That breaks our family rule of being kind and safe. That's a fact. You're just stating it, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm always walking around going, you left your light on in your bedroom. <laughs> like, it's just what happened, <laughs> you know? Um, and so here's another example of if your child is like running late for a Zoom meeting, maybe that's not relevant to you at all, but insert something that is, you know, get on your Zoom meeting. Do you wanna be late? I'm raising a slow poke. Instead, just say what's so. It's 927 and your meeting starts in three minutes. And later we should probably think about ways to help you get ready earlier, you know? 
So you don't have to insult them. It's too late. You know, it, it's, it's, you can't go back in time. Let's just make a mental note to sit down later and work as a team to come up with a better system. And I always say that we don't want to fix the child. The child is not broken. We want to fix the system that they're living in. And so coming up with systems and plans and routines and changing the environment to support their listening is much more effective than just expecting them to listen. Okay. Last example, put your plate away. Aren't you, aren't you going to put your plate away? You're being a slob, you know, instead we need an agreement for getting the kitchen clean. I'm interested in hearing your ideas. You know, this is just like, lay it out like it is. I mean, we, I just had this conversation last night with my son. I said, you know, I've noticed that every evening you get up and leave the dinner table. You know, one, my oldest son clears the table, but he doesn't clear my middle son's plate because my middle son is usually not at the table with a full plate of food still. And we're like, where did he go? You know? <laughs> um, and so we're, uh, you know, I sat down with him and I was like, I'm noticing that we have this recurring issue and like, let's figure out a plan for this. And he told me, he said, he, my brother should clear my plate. And then his job is to do the dishwasher. He said, when it's my turn to do the dishwasher, I'll finish the food that I need to finish. And I said, but I, I have to make sure you eat your broccoli. He was like, no, trust me. Like I don't waste food. I will, I will eat it. And so we tried it and, and it worked. <laughs> so it's collaborative problem solving, right? Sometimes. Um, we're going to skip the receptive assertive model, but this is about using, you know, using listening and speaking and balancing those so that you're focusing on your feelings and also your child's feelings. Okay, so let's go through, like, I'm just going to go through three, one tip on each of these next slides. So I chose for today, I chose this idea of using the rewind button to give second chances. Kids learn by being able to do things right the second time. So if they make a mistake, we want to use the rewind button, meaning we say, uh oh, you know, time to rewind. That didn't work. Let's go back to the last time you were doing this correctly and try again. Even if they're ignoring you, you can use the rewind button. You can say, you know, let's say you said, um, go brush your teeth. You know, it's time to brush your teeth. Oh, it's it's 630. We brush teeth at 630. It's time to get going. Um, and they ignore you. It's OK to say, uh oh, like I noticed that you didn't listen to me. You just state what you saw and then you say, oh, let's rewind. Let me, I'm going to say it again. And this time you're going to listen to me, you know? So you're just giving them a second chance to do it right. And that's, I know that sounds like really focused for younger kids, but if you have an older kid, I do this with my older son also. It's, you know, you can just be like, okay, second chance, let's have a do over. You know, you adjust it for their, for their personality. And then on this slide, the tip that I chose to share with you today is about getting close. It's a tip I call up close. And this is about when you're asking your child to do something, if you really want them to do it, three steps. First, go to them, get close to them before you make your request, before you tell them what needs to get done. And then make contact, make connection acknowledge, oh, I see that you're doing something, you know, important. Oh, you're building something. Oh, you're working on your math homework. Oh, is, you know, show me what you're doing. Oh, you're watching a TV show. What's it about? You know, and then you make your request and you stay there until they're listening to you, until their feet are moving in the direction that you need them to move. If you're asking them to get off screens, you're going to go to them. You're going to take an interest in what they're doing, acknowledge, respect, you know, show that you understand that they're in a different world than you right now and then help them transition out of it. But you want to stay there until they're moving. And a lot of people say to me, I don't have time for that. I'm in the middle of doing something. I need them to act, you know? Well, the problem is that I say is that when you making this little investment up front of going to them could save you a huge amount of hassle and resentment later you just are going to have a really clear boundary that they need to listen to you the first time and you're going to support them in doing that until they're in the habit of it okay so it won't be it won't be immediate i don't think there's any quick fixes in parenting but when we do acknowledge that our children are in a different world than us sometimes and we support them in coming out of it you know and in joining us we get a lot further a lot quicker Okay, this last one is avoiding lectures, explanations, and logical arguments. These are like the bane of my existence. <laughs> so Adele Faber, who wrote the book, um, uh, How to Talk So Kids Will Listen, she has a quote, the, the harder we explain, the harder they protest. 
And this is something that I work with all of my clients around. It's like, they're so busy explaining their point of view to their children that they're not stopping to acknowledge that their child has a different point of view. And so there becomes a tug of war where it's like, I'm over here with my point of view, you're over there with your point of view, and I'm gonna try to pull you to mine. I'm, I'm right, you're wrong, and I'm gonna say all the things that, you know, you've been on the screens too long, you've eaten too much sugar today, you know, you're gonna be late, it's not nice, you're gonna get a bad grade, you're gonna get cavities. I mean, we like have all these reasons that we think that our kids should listen, but none of that helps them listen. It just makes them want to protest more. And so we wanna skip all of that. And instead we wanna just take a minute to pay attention to what their point of view is and help validate and legitimize and articulate what might be going on for them. Because I guarantee you, if you look under the surface of every single behavior, you will find a legitimate reason for it. And when you can appreciate that there's a legitimate reason for it, even if it's that your child bit somebody, even if it's that your child did something that seems really egregious, there is a reason from their perspective that it was legitimate. And until you take the time to hear what that was and, and help figure it out, you're going to be the enemy. And, and you don't want to be the enemy because otherwise communication breaks down. Okay. Okay. So I'm, I'm going so fast. So I'm just going to wrap up right now, but at first I want to tell you all, if you're, if you're curious about learning more about the slides I didn't share, you know, or if you're interested in getting some private coaching or just staying in touch with me, I would love to stay in touch with all of you. My website is sklarparenting.com. In a minute, I'm going to take time to put some of these things in the, um, in the uh, chat. My website is sklarparenting.com. When you go there after like five seconds, you get a pop-up window and it's top five tips that surprise my clients most. So you can learn what those are if you sign up. Um, also, I'm running a preschool parent program right now. There's actually three weeks left, um, but it's a sort of a, um, a curriculum that's you listen to audios, you know, listen while you're multitasking, cleaning the, you know, cleaning the kitchen, going for a walk, whatever. And then you, and then I do a drop in Q and A on Fridays where you come and just ask all your parenting questions and connect with other parents of preschoolers. Um, I also have a moms of middle schoolers program coming up soon. That's going to be a small group coaching program. We're going to run for six Fridays and we're going to um, just support one another. And you're going to learn sort of all of the reasons why your middle schoolers acting the way they are and how you can set them up for the uh, the high school years much better. And then also I do private coaching and I do lunch and learns at companies. So if your company might be interested in bringing in a speaker, that's something that I really love to do. So I'm going to put some of that in the chat before we, uh, a second. So do you want me to put the, Michelle, do you want me to put the reflection questions in the chat also? Thank you for asking that. Yeah, I think um, we have our facilitators and they all received the questions and sent those out. So you don't need to, but thank you for asking. And um, yeah, everyone. So thank you so much, Rachel. Um, it's always.